very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Express Adda. Uh, some of you uh, have been before. I can see a few familiar faces, but not all. Uh, Express Adda is a forum where we speak to people who are interesting, powerful, influential. We speak to those who have uh, who push change uh, on the planet. In some cases, in India and in the world, and who seed good ideas, who who generate ideas, and who are with them, and bring a unique and interesting perspective with which to view the world. And among the most interesting people to be with us on Adda is Romulus Vitica. Welcome, Romulus. And uh, today at Adda, my colleague Swamya Ashok and I, Seema Chishti, are delighted to welcome you. And uh, there is just so much to kind of say about uh, Rom. Uh, to introduce him is a bit of a tricky job. So I'm hoping that in the course of our conversations, where you also can join in uh, in a while and ask questions, we hope we'll unfold all facets and dimensions of Romulus. But uh, I'm actually tempted to quote Romulus on himself. He said, people often mistake me for a rabid hippie conservationist, but I'd like to be remembered as a reptile freak. So, uh, you know, a herpetologist, conservationist, wildlife enthusiast, the snake man of India, he set up the famous snake park of Chennai. And uh, there is just so much about, you know, the, the books he's written, his book chapters. Uh, Romulus grew up as a child in New York and came to India in the early 50s, a very interesting time to, to be here at the age of eight. And I think caught a snake when you were four. And so, so there's all of that which we will go into uh, slowly. Uh, so... May I, Rom, would you like to sort of start by saying something about what you do and uh, maybe uh, show us a short film? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I, I'm a total non-academic herpetologist. Uh, when, when you use a fancy word like herpetologist, people ask you, is that something to do with the disease herpes? <laughs> no, it's, or, it's the creepy crawlies, I prefer saying. It's the snakes, the crocodiles, something I've been in love with all my life. I, I owe it very much to my dear departed mother, who, when I was four years old and I brought a snake home, she didn't say, get it out of here. She said, how beautiful. Shall we keep it? I mean, fantastic. What a way to start. And that was it. I mean, for the rest of my life, I just became a snake nut. When we moved to India in 1951, however, um, I think she was thinking a little bit differently then. She said, now we're moving to the land of cobras and stuff like that. How this little kid is going to react or how the snake's going to react when he finds them. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, it all worked out. I'm still alive and uh, still kicking. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh Ram, I mean, the snake, as you know, creepy crawlies, as you put it, the snake is among the first, it is the first animal mentioned in the Bible, you know, you have the snake is discussed in ancient societies, mm. then why is it that, you know, they are the creepy crawlies? And how did you get interested in them? I think, tell us a little bit about being young and being in love with creepy crawlies. Well, I, I, first of all, I, I noticed uh, in my experience that most kids are very interested in little things that creep and crawl. And most parents are not interested in having them interested, if you know what I mean. In other words, don't touch that. Don't bring it in the house, etc. So, And kids, of course, react to what their parents say. When I was a kid, um, we spent some of my early years in New York City, and I got to the New York Natural History Museum again with my mother and my sister, and I fell in love with dinosaurs. And interestingly enough, I find a lot of kids who come up to me and say, oh, I want to be a snake guy just like you or something. I started with dinosaurs, and it's true. They're just, it was just such a fascinating world. Uh, and, and we always felt that we were born many millions of years too late. I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful to walk outside and hear a Tyrannosaurus Rex tromping around? <laughs> Not really, no, it'd be pretty scary. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, that's how it all started. And uh, I think every sort of step of my career was, uh, uh, I mean, ordained in, by fate or something, because in school, for example, I, I brought home a, a pit viper and to the biology class, and luckily I 
you know, brought it back safely in a nice big jar and stuff like that. And the biology teacher said, wow, what a beautiful snake. Let's put it on display and keep it in the lab for a while here. So we kept it and fed it and stuff like that. So there, again, was another bit of encouragement. Had he said, get that damn thing out of here, well, again, I probably wouldn't be here talking about snakes today. So it's been a lot of encouragement all the way along. Ram, you nearly became a filmmaker. I mean, you've done a lot of work on film and you kind of, you go out and talk about what you do and the importance of that and how, how that connects to the larger world we're in. Mm -hmm. But uh, tell me about your stepfather who set up the first color processing lab in Bombay. So how did that uh, sort of work with what you do? <laughs> yeah, that was a very interesting time too because, uh, I mean, hobnobbing with the likes of Vijanti Mala and Dev Anand and stuff, I was like nine or ten years old, so it was all lost on me, quite honestly. But when I talk about it now, people say, really? You met them? Yeah, well, we're, we were sitting there watching the rushes of their latest film at, the, at Ram Nord Lab in Bombay, which my stepfather started. And uh, I guess the, it sort of left something very deep inside me that reaching out to people through film is really the way to go. I mean, I, I, we set up uh, the snake park in, in Madras and uh, you know a million people came there the first year but every film that we've made is seen by tens of millions of people and this is the way to reach out and that, that was very very well proven to me. Uh, a lot of us kind of use animal names as metaphors you know it's regularly heard as abuse and as descriptors. Uh, how do you as somebody who looks at animals and human beings as in, in a different way from uh, most of those who abuse with that. How do you look at that? Um, I'm not sure how to say it politely. No, don't, please don't be polite. <laughs> uh, well, uh, people are pretty derogatory about snakes, for example, which, and it was kind of always the underdog in the animal world that attracted me, and I, I became very fascinated with bats and toads and things that people don't, you know, usually sort of cuddle. Uh, and domestic animals, I was always a bit against cats and dogs. Um, lately, my wife has sort of convinced me that dogs are actually very lovable, and yeah, we do love the dogs we have at home. But uh, no, I, I still am for the wild animal, and I, I just don't think there's enough space for all of us on this planet. <laughs> uh, just before we come to Soumya, who has, who's, who's got a uh, who will uh, carry over from our questions, uh, then you have a different view with conservation, and I, you, I heard you say somewhere that it's not wildlife that needs to be conserved, but uh, human beings need to worry about our own state on the planet. So can you talk us a little bit about that perspective of looking at conservation? Yeah. Um, when you look at uh, conservation, well, let's look at, I mean, we're talking about India, and uh, we've got a, 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 a wonderful, a strange but wonderful dichotomy in India going. We've got a, a level of tolerance among Indian people, among rural Indian people, people who live very close to nature, which is beyond belief. Nowhere else in the world is there a country where all its major predators are still existing. We've wiped them out virtually throughout the world, except in India. And, uh, and a few other parts of the world. And it's because of this amazing tolerance uh, that people have toward animals. So I think we should take that as our, our big lesson and, uh, uh, and, and make sure that people continue to feel that way as best we can. I just need to check with my colleagues if we're in a position to show a film, Ram, which you may want to take us through that. Yeah. Shall we just go for that and then Soumya? Adrenaline is pumping, man. Watch out, watch out, I can't control it. Oh, she's beautiful. She's beautiful. Absolutely. Oh, my God. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I feel the way you do. She's talking. Don't worry, we won't be out for long. It's the dragon. And I'm on a quest to track one down. There's an obvious conclusion here. You do not want to be bitten by a Komodo dragon. Nor do you want to be bitten by Rom Whitaker? Whoa. What is it? 
I didn't do anything. Whoa! Whoa! Well, there are very few reptiles who will do this. Okay, I'll take a bath next time. They say that reptiles get tired real easy. <laughs> How about humans? <laughs> Reptile expert Romulus Whitaker has committed his life to conservation. Long ago, he realized protecting India's snakes would be impossible without first factoring in human welfare. Armed with this new data and more than three decades of field experience, Rom is about to investigate the natural history behind these incredible statistics. Yes, yes. Look, 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 look. See how fat his body is, so that's his yolk. He's absorbed all that yolk and he's going to survive on that for the next week. Just think this guy's going to grow up to be 15 feet long. Lots means how many gorilla are dead? Okay, this is a very sacred moment. But we got to remember that Gariel are able to turn around almost completely. Wow. Fantastic. Eh? Fantastic. feet of venomous snake. You know, this is the super snake. In comparison, an anaconda is like a big earthworm. This is the story of one man's quest to save the king. southern India so it's perfectly natural for me as far as I'm concerned to settle here and uh, it has all the elements that I love the warm weather plenty of reptiles good people good hot food Careful out there in the jungle. Surely to the sea, darling, so it goes. Some things are meant to be. Take my. So you got to be corny when TV. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, most people are terrified of snakes. I, for one, am terrified of even cats. 
many would be happy or even completely unperturbed if tomorrow morning they wake up and read in the newspaper that every single snake in this country is dead. So my question to you is, how do you, the lover of snakes, get through to such people? And through the snakes, how do you let people know about the larger ecosystem? Well, um, I, I try to be, um, let's say, logical about things. First of all, if we didn't have snakes, we'd be overrun by rats, for sure. As rats, rodents in general, are the snake's favorite food. So uh, that's sort of an easy explanation to give, but uh, on the other hand, it's a little bit more difficult to try to get people to learn how to avoid snakes and avoid getting bitten by snakes, especially in a country where we have literally 50,000 people dying of snake bite every year and many, many thousands more permanently injured by snakes. We're looking at a, a rather drastic, rather big problem here. And uh, there are several reasons for this, and, and these are all solvable reasons since snake bites are accidents and they are avoidable. But uh, getting all these messages to the right people out there in rural India is not an easy job. And we are a country steeped in a lot of misbeliefs, a lot of beliefs about snakes and about uh, uh, things that are almost religious in belief and, and, and stuff that it's a little bit awkward to try to say, no, you're, whatever your grandfather told you is a lie. And you don't say things like that. You have to do it in a much more diplomatic way and get it across to people that snakes, in fact, aren't after us. Snakes are, in fact, very frightened of us. And, uh, and they're there because, well, we've invited them home because we've invited rats home, and rats love us. I mean, we, we're the best thing that rats that ever occurred to rats. The amount of garbage we hand around, the crops that we grow are perfect for rodents as well. So uh, we've, we've created a rather strange ecology in India, really, and not only in India, in other similar countries where a lot of rice is grown, for example. And, uh, and I, I, I guess the best example would be to take someone into the forest to try to see a snake. People often say, don't go in the forest, it's very dangerous, there are a lot of snakes there. Just the opposite is true. It's don't go into the rice fields, that's where the snakes are. And snakes are very common in agriculture in India and they're very rare in the forest. You have a lot of different species in the forest, yes, but numbers of snakes are incredibly high in agricultural areas and that's where the danger is. And people, um, are from abroad particularly come here and say, well, why don't you wear shoes when you harvest rice? Well, just try that someday. I mean, it, it's not possible. Barefoot is the way to go. Uh, they're trying stuff in Burma, for example, where they've uh, started doing experiments with using uh, uh, various kinds of um, uh, rubber gum boots sort of thing. Simple, inexpensive, but they are saving lives that way. So this, this is a possibility in India as well. Another problem is, for example, people, uh, one issue of snake bite that happens in India, which is really scary, is that a lot of people are bitten, sleeping in villages on the ground or on the floor of their huts, are bitten at night while they're asleep. And it, by a particular species of snake called the crate, which a lot of you are probably familiar with the name anyway. The crate is a very uh, innocuous type of snake. It's not one of these dramatic guys like the cobra who sits up and he doesn't hiss and make a lot of noise. It's a very quiet snake which eats rodents. It comes to people's houses for rodents. And it comes and perhaps crawls next to people while they're asleep. Uh, the movement of their hand, the smell of their skin, some stimulus makes them bite. And when they bite, it is not a painful bite, which is another insidious thing, really, because if it was painful, then immediately you'd react and go to a hospital and get treatment. When a crate bites, there's hardly any pain, and uh, you might wake up and say, well, I got bitten by something if you didn't see it, and perhaps the family would say, well, we'll check it out in the morning. Well, the problem is the morning may not arrive for that person because the crate venom is so toxic. So a simple thing like everyone sleeping on the ground, if they had a mosquito net, they would probably prevent that, not to mention dengue and malaria and all the rest of it. So there are simple solutions to these very, very serious problems, but getting this word out to the rural public is our biggest challenge probably right now. 
So I'm going to come back to the uh, snake bite. Uh, I have a bunch of questions. But before that, um, your wife's book, Janaki's book, the first one, My Husband and Other Animals, and I have the second one here, which I haven't actually read as yet. Um, but the first one has this fantastic anecdote about you as a young boy in Kodai Kanal with your pet python and how you used to take it back to your grandmother's house in Bombay, who you referred to, uh, who you called Amma Doodles. And um, she used to phone up, if, if somebody was going to come around, a pesky guest, she would say, oh great, come over and see my grandson, he's visiting with his snake. And somehow, miraculously, uh, the guest had something else to do. Um, it then goes on to say how your snake ran away, or rather, crawled away, sorry. Um, and you couldn't find him. So could you please recollect that particular uh, incident? Yeah. And also, did he have a name? And how did you, as a young boy, look carrying around this python on the streets, in the dorms, in your, in your hostel, or on the train? Oh, boy. <laughs> well, the lovely grandmother, my step-grandmother, Kamala Devi Chattopadhyaya, probably used that ruse more than once to... Uh, to keep away unwanted visitors. She was always getting a lot of <laughs> visitors and uh, some of them never came back. Um, yeah, the snake did get away. I was staying in an uh, apartment in uh, Bombay uh, on Marine Drive and uh, one day I looked in the box and the glass had slid apart. So, uh, I, I really don't know how it got out, but snakes are that way. They, they're very tricky about that. And it was gone. So I had to go to every flat in the building, knock on the door and say, my pet is missing. I was just wondering if you happen to see. <laughs> and of course, everyone said, oh, really? You know, and they were thinking, pussycat, puppy, something like that. <laughs> what is your pet? Uh, it's a, a python, not very big one. It's a smallish python, about eight feet long. <laughs> well, you can imagine the reactions of various people. OK, to make a long story short, I did get through the entire building. And eventually, we did find the python who was hidden under one of the trunks in our storeroom. So thank goodness for that, because I can imagine the police being called, the fire department, or getting into all sorts of complications. The same thing, uh, a similar sort of thing happened on a train journey when I was with my sister coming from Kodi Canal back to Bombay. We were on a train, and uh, I was on one of the upper berths, and my sister was also, and she reached across and woke me up and pointed down. And I could see I had a sand boa which had gotten out of a bag. Well, it had actually crawled through the knot. Sand boas are that way, they're very strong. And its head was just sticking out. Luckily, no one else was awake. So I quickly jumped down, got it back inside, tied the knot, put it into a second bag. But you can imagine the consternation. I, there are several other stories like this, but we won't go on. I mean, it's <laughs> did, did your python have a name? Uh, that particular python was Samson. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so this is a question, um, sort of what Seema had touched upon. But in many ways, we live in a land of contradictions. So we have a holy river, and yet we pollute it. We pray to the snake in many parts of this country, yet mm -hmm. we might not think of conservation around it as much as we would, say, for a uh, tiger or an elephant. But it, it's also snake stereotypes, which forever give the snake a bad reputation. So if you have Adam and Eve, Harry Potter, Indian politicians calling each other snakes, a whole lot of ways that people use it Negatively. in the wrong way. Yeah. So how do you adapt in India to the cultural context? Uh, you have spoken about this a bit, but I wonder if uh, social media sort of, have you seen something of late that... Um, you know, I, I've been seeing a lot of dramatic changes probably in the last six or eight years uh, about the attitude towards snakes. And I, I'll just take one particular example because it just happened last week. We were in Agumbe. You might have heard about Agumbe. It's the highest rainfall area in South India. It's where we set up our field station back in 2005. We're, we're doing a study on king cobras using radio telemetry there. And we've got a couple of trackers who are, they're just volunteers. They're very keen young guys who are interested in snakes. They've joined us. We've trained them how to use the radio antenna to follow the snakes around. We visited a house the other day, uh, where uh, a house in the middle of a large areca nut plantation, and they have a small coffee plantation, and then rice fields. 
And the king cobra that these, this tracker was following happened to be hunting around this farmhouse. So he had to go and uh, answer a phone call because his phone didn't work there at one of the uh, local stations. And he asked the lady of the house, she, he said, I'm really sorry, I have to leave you now. The, the snake is okay, it's not doing anything. I'll be back soon. The lady of the house said, don't worry, I'll watch the snake until you get back and everything will be okay. And he was kind of startled and came and called, called us actually and said, well, come on down and we're following the snake. And we went there and sure enough, the lady was there watching the snake very interestingly. And I don't speak Kannada very well, but through the interpreter with us, I said, so uh, how do you feel about it? And she said, no, it's okay. It's been around for the last two weeks here hunting. And yesterday we saw a cobra and we know that king cobras eat cobras. And we're just hoping that king cobra will eat that cobra. <laughs> and this was from a, a, a lady who is, you know, she, her, it's her first experience, a close experience with a king cobra. She had seen them in the past, but never this close. And she was absolutely calm and okay about it. Similarly, on the same day, we found a, a female king cobra lying on her nest. King cobras are the only snake in the world out of the 3,000 odd species who actually make a beautiful mound nest to lay their eggs. And uh, this particular nest was 50 meters away from a household where there are two little girls, about seven or eight years old, and they were absolutely fascinated in seeing this female king cobra making her nest, gathering the leaves together, lying there on top of it. And uh, they are actually protecting the nest because a lot of other people came around and started wanting to bother the snake, throw stones at it and stuff like that. But the whole family is quite okay with it being there. They say, but please, when the babies hatch, kindly remove them. It's okay? We say, of course it's okay, we'll do that. But they're letting the eggs be and letting the uh, eggs incubate there. A, a marvelous change in attitude. So one more question before I hand it back to Seema. Um, you've said in interviews, and you just said it before, that children would take to reptiles if it weren't for their parents. Um, and that's not the case in your life. Um, mm. Is that more or less true across the world? And how do some people at a young age choose a snake to be a friend with rather than a box full of marbles? Like, with, I'm politely asking if you have to be eccentric to love snakes at a young age. Well, I used to play with marbles too when I was about, <laughs> But <laughs> no, I, um, yeah, that's a, a really good question. First of all, parents are protective about their kids, and quite rightfully so. There are some venomous species of snakes, as there are some insects. I and mean, you certainly don't want a kid playing around with a scorpion, whereas you know, a beetle or something like that is a perfectly acceptable pet or something to at least observe close up. So it's a question of teaching kids what's safe and what's not safe. So it takes a little bit of extra effort. But I think that extra effort is worth it because that can open a whole world of of a fascinating life to the kid for the rest of his life in terms of you know, being close to nature and not being scared of things. So it's a wonderful opportunity that parents have to get kids into that. But, yeah. Uh, Ram, I mean, we've spoken about snakes and I want to take you to ghadiyals in a while. But before that, you know, while you were talking about children and getting them uh, interested in, in animals and creepy crawlies, uh, what do you have to say about the state of zoos in India in particular? Hmm. Have we missed a trick there in our inability to really draw and keep young children interested and show them this fascinating world? Yeah. I to get into a discussion of zoos would be a little awkward right now. I mean, we operate one of the large zoos in the country, which is the Madras Crocodile Bank, uh, with 2,500 animals there, and we try to look after them as best we can. I, I know that some zoos are much better than others, and some of them don't really add up to the mark. One of the uh, sad things which has happened recently is that um, we are no longer allowed to uh, allow a child to touch a snake, for example. And I, I can understand why this ruling came about, because people would mishandle a snake or, or even a baby crocodile. When we put a rubber band around a crocodile's nose, people objected, saying, no, that must be very harmful to it. So I replaced the rubber band with a pink ribbon, hoping that that would uh, <laughs> alleviate the, the criticism. But I, I do understand why that ruling is there. But uh, on the other hand, it's used worldwide that 
and I, it does work, that if a child gets to touch a snake along with a good explanation of C, it, it's absolutely dry, clean, wonderful to the touch. It just opens up a whole world of excitement to that kid, and, and they're not allowed to do that anymore here. I wish that could be somehow changed. And, and, and the zoo, of course, does perform a wonderful function for the millions of city goers, particularly, who never really get an opportunity to see animals close up. So if it's done well, a zoo is a really good thing to have, yes. But it's got to be done well. Yeah. Ram, uh, you launched on Project Gharial, I think, and that was because you felt it was a huge danger yeah. as to what we were doing to our rivers, and it was telling a much bigger story than just conserving yeah. Gharials. Yeah. So could you take us a bit into the Gharial world and what prompted you to to do that, and I have a, a sort of related question. Uh, I mean, the, the tiger is also under a lot of stress, and some of my friends, uh, you know, tiger uh, enthusiasts are here. But do you think that we've kind of got a little too carried away with the tiger question to worry about other species, and we've sort of, uh, you know, focused too much on the tiger? I mean, not that we've done very, very much as much as we should have, but we've lost track of the other big species that need help. It it, it is true to some extent. Um, we, we could say we're all in competition with each other for the interests of, of, of people and the support of people for different species. But yeah, uh, as far as the gharial is concerned, uh, it kind of epitomizes um, today uh, clean rivers. Uh, the so-called unholy river of the Chumbal is one of the cleanest large rivers, if not the cleanest large river we have left in the country. Isn't that a fantastic irony that, that our holy rivers, the Ganga and the Yamuna, are amongst the filthiest rivers in the world. And Gharial can't live very well there anymore. There are a few coming back, luckily, thanks to uh, the help from World Wildlife Fund and, and a lot of very, uh, very dedicated uh, people with Wildlife Institute of India and other people. But the, 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 the Chumbal is really the last safe repository for the, for the gharial, we're sad to say. Not only that, the river dolphin and many species of turtles and fish and so on. So it is kind of an irony that uh, it's, it's, it's not a river which is considered one of the holy rivers and, and yet it's still intact. So uh, I, I did surveys of crocodiles back in the early 1970s and found that uh, we, we have three species in India, the mugger, the freshwater crocodile, the gharial, and the saltwater crocodile. And all three of them, especially the gharial, were very close to extinction. And this prompted the government of India to start Project Crocodile under uh, the prime ministership of Indira Gandhi. And with the help of the Food and Agriculture Organization, a specialist came over. And we started a, a very strong conservation uh, project for crocodiles. The, another irony of it is that we've been so successful that crocodiles are literally bouncing back. You've all heard about the Andaman Islands, you've heard about Gujarat, and you've heard now more recently about Tamil Nadu, where crocodile numbers are increasing, attacks are increasing, and now we have to educate people how to live with crocodiles, not how to conserve them, how to live with them. So we're falling into a, a similar trend which has happened in other parts of the world. And it's, it's really up to us so-called conservationists to get on that bandwagon and get people to understand how to live with these animals. They are big predators, after all. Yeah. Rob, you uh, investigated some gharials who were falling sick very dramatically. And you, you did some stuff and you figured that they had a case of gout. Yeah. And how, uh, what was affecting just the gharials and seemed like a problem away from our lives was actually kind of a pre-warning to what would happen to humans and other consumers of that water. So could you take us a bit through that? that that's time? probably taking the story even further than I was, would be able to say because there was no proof of exactly why or how this happened. And it seemed like a single toxic event. The, uh, the early uh, symptoms of gout we felt were from a, a, I mean, a, what they call a toxic incident and we felt that perhaps they're going down to the Yamuna River and eating fish which are in incredibly full of heavy metals and all sorts of things, and then uh, r resulting in the, in the illness that, that killed uh, more than 100 gharial at that time. But it turns out that's not so at all. Uh, it turns out that it's more likely that something was actually dumped off one of the rivers that crosses the, the, the uh, Chamba and uh, somehow got into the 
either into the fish or into directly into the gharial, and that's what happened. It's still a bit of a mystery, but it still shows that how vulnerable a species can be to a toxic event like that. Just to stay on the gharial a little bit, is that you also remarked that uh, it is known that the gharial sort of never went extinct. It kind of, it is one of the oldest creatures alive. Mm -hmm. And you've also spoken about the immense intelligence that, that crocodiles have yeah. and that gharials have. So uh, just, just explain a little bit about what, you know, what is that kind of intelligence that you, you, yeah, know, I, you saw? Yeah, what's absolutely amazing is uh, the, what happened at the, um, in, in a place called the... Uh, an alligator farm in Florida called St. Augustine Alligator Farm, they started a croc school. They started teaching crocodiles to do various things the way you teach dogs to do various things. And uh, a friend of ours, Sohan Mukherjee, who works in Gujarat with animal uh, rescues and stuff, was working for us then, and he started to train our crocodiles. We started out with Allie the alligator. She was already a very friendly alligator. And then we included a saltwater crocodile, a Siamese crocodile, and a Cuban crocodile. We have quite a few different species there. While he was teaching Ali to come, to go, to open mouth, to sit down, to stand up, to do things like you would teach a dog, the other crocs were watching Ali getting her treats. And we didn't know it then, but they were learning these <laughs> same tricks without getting the treats. Now that took crocodile intelligence reams further than we had ever realized they were capable of. And it turns out they are very smart indeed. And relating that to what the Gariel are doing now, a friend of ours called Jeffrey Lang, who's been working with us for the last 30 years on crocodiles in India, he comes from the States, comes over here, he's sitting on the chumble in 45 degree weather right now, uh, watching the hatching which is taking place uh, on the chumble. All the gharial babies are, this week will probably start emerging from their eggs. And uh, he has found out that the male gharial is the one who takes most of the care of the hatchlings. And one male will look after a, a creche of up to a thousand baby gharial. Some of you may have seen the recent photographs in the uh, BBC Wildlife and perhaps there have been other places where these photographs have been shown where a, a male gharial with a whole bunch of babies sitting around on its head, absolutely incredible pictures. And this is the male who will very often chase the females and we say, forget it, you guys have done your job, now it's my turn to look at. <laughs> and if a jackal or if a, a bird of prey or a, a, a white-necked stork, anything comes nearby, he'll chase them, protecting these babies. Uh, Jeff calls them super dads, and I, I go with that. So going back to another anecdote from Janaki's book, um, she talks about how people get mercilessly mocked when bitten by a snake. So to quote her book, she says, if a snake catcher gets bitten by a venomous snake, it is, is, it is his own fault. He was careless, most probably trying to show off and wasn't paying attention. So she writes that you got mocked mercilessly when a moccasin, am I saying it right, bit your arm in fl the Florida Everglades. And yet when you moved to India, you saw that snake bites were being celebrated. So when young men were getting bitten, the whole village comes to see them and it became a big event. So what do these two sort of different cultural references say about <laughs> Indian men and snake bites? <laughs> well, I, this, this stuff is more a recent phenomenon. Uh, we always mocked each other back in those days, in those Florida days when I was hunting there. Because if someone did get bitten, it was because he was acting stupidly and he made a mistake. Okay. Uh, the idea nowadays, uh, in India, there's a tremendous resurgence of what we call snake rescuers, guys out there who are called, and ostensibly for a good purpose, to get a snake out of someone's house, out of harm's way. That's fine. But they take it one step too far very often and then hold it up, free-handling it, trying to kiss it, doing all sorts of absolute idiotic things. I got a, a really horrifying report from a friend of ours just in Maharashtra alone. 25 young men have been killed in the last three years just playing with snakes like this. And that is insane. The problem is the snake always gets the bad end of it because well, you can't hardly say to someone's family that your son was an idiot, he got killed by a snake. No, no, it was the snake's horrible, venomous nature and, and, and you know, never mind, my son was a dumb idiot, but uh, 
so quite honestly, our, our message out there right now is to try to get people to be reasonable about it. And usually most of these rescuers say that they do like snakes and they're doing it for the sake of the snakes. And we're trying to argue with them saying, yes, well, if you are, well, then respect the snake, have respect for him and don't play with him and don't try to do stupid things because if he does bite you, chances are you might die. We hope the lesson will get across. Um, you met the snake-catching Irula tribe many, many years ago. They became good friends of yours. You learned from them. They had deep understanding mm. of snakes. Can you please reflect on your relationship over all these years with the Irulas and specifically the cooperative that runs within the Madras Croc Bank at the moment? Yeah, I, I met the Irulas way, way back there in the late 60s. And uh, I was introduced to them by a guy called Harry Miller who was quite a character himself. He worked for the Indian Express. And uh, yes, he was, the, <laughs> he was their chief photographer. You didn't get that one. <laughs> okay, gotcha. <laughs> and uh, he said, you've got to meet these Irulas. Well, he was very interested in snakes himself. He wrote an article for National Geographic and even got my picture published in National Geographic magazine. Wow. So uh, way back then. And he introduced me to the Irulas and sure enough, I still maintain, I maintain then, and I still today, they are the best snake hunters in the world. They really know how to find snakes. They'll see a small track on the ground and tell you what species it is, when it went this way, where it is now, that kind of thing. They were, in those days, in the late 60s, early 70s, hunting them for skins. They were catching millions of snakes for skins. We exported up to 10 million snake skins a year till about 1974. 75 when the Wildlife Act came into. So when the Wildlife Act came into effect, the Irulas were basically, well, the, all the Irula snake hunters, they, they, they ran out of jobs. They didn't have another job. And uh, they're not farmers at all, they're hunter-gatherers, so there was really not much for them to do. We hatched an idea together, the Irulas and myself, of starting a venom cooperative, and that's what we did. We registered a cooperative society in 1978, and uh, they now catch snakes to this day up to about eight or 10,000 a year and bring them to the Irla Cooperative, extract venom from them three or four times, and then release them back to the wild. This venom is used to make life-saving antivenom. It's the only, the only cure for snake bite in India. So even though the Irlas, I, I try to get it across to them how important the work they're doing, I'm sure they, they have a vague understanding of it but they don't realize they're literally saving millions of lives in India because perhaps a million people get bitten in, in India by snakes every year and of those 50,000 die. So the Irlas are playing a tremendous role today. Uh, somewhere, Ram, do you think that the politics of environmentalism is kind of you know, leaving the animals behind? I mean, it is politics business to also make popular causes of important issues. But uh, on, on the whole question of environmentalism, is there a major kind of, you know, is everybody just sleepwalking through uh, a crisis which needs uh, political attention and will? Are you thinking about snake bite in particular? Or are you Not snake bite in particular, but uh, the broader issues that, uh, you know, conservation, our, our relationship with animals and vice versa. Uh, well, I, I'd probably look at it in a context of how it was 20 years ago or 30 years ago. I think we're on the up and up for sure. The awareness, the, the I mean, social media by itself, amongst the awareness, amongst the TV programs, the good ones that is, not the sensational ones, the ah, type ones, um, all mean that things are looking a lot better than they did, that's for sure. At the same time, we've got a, I wouldn't say burgeoning population, but we've got a population that keeps growing, a, a population of people who want to improve their lives and, and, and live the best lives that they can. And we've got developmental strategies in India which are pretty disastrous in many ways. So uh, there's certainly no complacency right now. We've, we've really got to keep on it, but things are definitely looking better than they did. That's, that's my general feeling. And I would ask specifically about snake bite and, and the snake bite project that mm -hmm. you're currently on. Um, you said before 50,000 people die every year from snake bites and 96% yeah. and of snake bites happen in villages yes. in India. Yes. And 
you've said often it's a serious medical emergency. People don't think of it that way, but it's a very serious emergency. Yes. So w what is your Snakebite project all about, if you can please tell us? And how widely do you travel the country? Because you, I think it depends on as many snakes, right? So you're trying to get a pool of snakes. Yeah. So please tell us how that works. Well, uh, it's uh, a multi-pronged project. We call it the Snakebite Mitigation Project. And uh, right now, it, uh, it's um, primarily involved, my personal involvement is going around the country and collecting venom samples from different parts of the country just to make sure that the antivenom, which is made mostly from venom from the Irla Cooperative in Tamil Nadu, whether the antivenom is good and effective throughout the country. So that's my particular role. The role of uh, a uh, an organization called Indian Snakes. They are actually mapping the uh, so-called big four, the cobra, crate, Russell's viper, and sawskill vipers, which are the most dangerous snakes in India, the ones that cause most of the serious bites and fatalities, and just trying to find out where the hot spots for these species are so that we know those are the places to target more medical attention, more, a better supply of antivenom, the third and probably the most important part of it, because the, the, uh, the obvious thing is that prevention is definitely better than the cure, because uh, if you can prevent people from getting snake bite, you're win winning the battle. So it's education. Our education program is now, it started in Tamil Nadu, it's now spreading out to six or seven of the major states where snake bite is most prevalent, and we're trying to make it an all India affair. We've produced three very short, hard-hitting videos, one called Snake Bite, one called The Four Deadliest Snakes of India, and one called Snake Rescue, The Expert Way. These are just short videos, very, very much to the point, and the Humane Society of India in uh, Hyderabad is now uh, translating them, dubbing them into all the regional languages. So we're, we're reaching, again, video, film, is, is really getting across to millions of people. So that's, that's in a nutshell, that's what we're trying to do. So since I'm a huge fan of Madras, that's where I'm from, um, I've been dragged to the Crocodile Bank on, a, on multiple occasions by my school. Dragged, really, from yeah. a young age, forced to hold hands with boys when you don't want to. Um, <laughs> and so can you describe to us Madras in the 1970s when you moved there? How did it look? But also, you and Janaki currently live on an amazing farm an hour and a half outside Madras, you said, with rows of ants, lots of frogs, a leopard that ate two of your dogs, a whole host of animals. So do you feel comfortable amongst humans or the creepy crawlies? Do I look comfortable? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yeah, Madras, good old Madras. I mean, Chennai is very difficult for me to say, just like Mumbai, I mean, it's Bombay and Madras. Anyway, old guys are like that. But uh, yeah, Madras was such a cool, quiet place in the 70s, uh, and uh, a very exciting place to start out what I was doing there. And it was amazing that, the, first of all, to set up a snake park there was kind of a wild idea. And uh, what was incredible is that the chief conservator of forests at that time came out and visited our little snake park, which is way outside the city near Tambaram, for those of you who know the area. And uh, he said, well, it's way out there. No one's going to come out there. What if we give you a piece of land inside the Gindi Deer Park inside the city? And I, I, my eyes must have you know, gotten really big, and I said, well, that, that sounds like a fantastic idea. So they gave us a 25-year lease on a half an acre of land for 250 rupees a year and the Madras Snake Park was born. I mean, what a magical time that was, especially considering I was still had my American citizenship. How can you give... <laughs> anyway, we won't go there right now. <laughs> but, <yeah. laughs> it was quite amazing, yeah. So, uh, yeah, did I get... This? One second. How, how is it living on a farm? Oh, okay, I got you. The farm that we live on is near a town called Chingalpet, and the beautiful part of it is that it's right adjacent to a small reserve forest called Vallam Reserve Forest, with a beautiful hill behind. Uh, we've nicknamed the hill Karadi Malai. Karadi means bear, Malai means mountain, so it's called Bear Mountain. 
but it's not because there are bears there, it's because Janaki, my wife's favorite dog, Karadi, was dragged up there after being killed by the leopard and was eaten there. So his spirit remains on that hill. So now it's called Karadi Malay. But sure enough, there are still leopards there. Uh, an Irla uh, guy who works for us said that he found some uh, leopard scat not far away from there. And we walked with him. We found seven leopard scats in just one small area. So there's definitely leopards there. But people have no big complaints. There are no problems. There no one ha has ever been attacked or killed by a leopard. So things are very okay. It's a very exciting place to live, even though it's quite close to the city. <laughs> well, this way clear where you're more comfortable. So I think just before we go to the audience for questions, I just have a question that has been bothering me for a few years. Uh, there's a story I read in, in an illustration, I think it was 2013. There was a young child who was playing on a riverbank and uh, you know, the cricket ball gets thrown into the river and uh, gets picked up by a baby crocodile. And this child jumps in, wrenches the ball out, and also brings a baby crocodile home, you know, in a bit to rescue it, goes home. And the mother says that, you know, you should never separate a mum from, uh, uh, from the baby. And the crocodile gets put back in the river. Now, you know, it just sounded too good to be true. In your experience of crocodiles, is this possible that this went through like this? And he didn't get bitten. <laughs> no mention of that in the illustration that I read. No, I'm afraid that doesn't happen that easily. <laughs> so it's not a nice quite story, but <laughs> but just a story. You just think, a you? story. Oh, excellent. So, do you want to open the floor for sure. questions? Sure. Uh, we open the floor now, so please uh, look for a mic and also introduce yourself before. Yes, please, before questions. you speak uh, and ask a question. My, our colleagues have mics here, so. Yeah. Hi, uh, Krishna here. Well, grown up watching your films on NGC and Discovery. Please identify yourself. Sorry. Krishna. Yeah. Krishna. Yeah. And uh, also been to the Madras Crocodile Bank. It was a fantastic place. And probably one, only one of its kind, it's privately owned in India, maybe. Uh, so my, and you, uh, my question is related to what you referred uh, briefly in your talk. Um, we don't allow f people to touch animals. Can we have such, um, can we do away with such restrictive rules and allow people to touch to, uh, on the model of South Africa or Australia or any other country and probably that could help the country's tourism to grow? It would. It, the thing is a certain standard has to be set and then followed. It, it, the reason why it was brought about is because of the mishandling of animals and that I must agree with. So how we frame the rules and make sure that they're enforced so that people don't mishandle animals is probably the big argument. But it would be wonderful if we could. I, I very strongly believe in just that touch of the snake opens people's minds and changes their mind forever. It really does. I am Anurag from uh, Sri Venkateshwara College Zoology on a second year and uh, first of all happy belated birthday and uh, of course uh, <laughs> yeah and uh, also like uh, you recently have been awarded with Padma Shri also congratulations for that so <laughs> thank, you. thank you and like uh, like yourself from the age of like when I was back in like fifth or sixth standard I always want to be an ophiologist and till now I've been working on that and I have even uh, designed a research proposal of how cytotoxin can be used to uh, like treat the cancers and other tumor growths at extra. So my question goes like um, one of your documentary I was watching back when I was in 11th. So is it true that it is important to remove the female king cobra from the nest or she will eat her own sibling, uh, oh sorry, hatchlings? Um, that's a really good question, and if I knew the answer, uh, I would tell you right away. But frankly, um, as far as we know, the king cobra usually does leave the nest before the babies hatch. And in fact, in the Western Ghats, it looks like the female leaves the nest even within a week or two after laying the eggs. But I found a nest in the Andaman Islands once, and after collecting the eggs uh, and the female, 
the eggs hatched within about 10 days. So she was staying there almost throughout the entire incubation period. King cobras are cannibalistic. We have recorded, even very recently, an adult male king cobra eating an adult female king cobra several times. We thought it was just something that would happen in captivity, but it, it happens in the wild as well. There's, there's, I, I could go into it in detail, but it's, it has to do with hormonal stuff, uh, you know, whether the snake is in the breeding season or whether it's just plain hungry, that kind of stuff. But I know there's no good answer to your question yet. <laughs> Hi, Neha Sinha, right here at the back. Hi. Um, so we're talking a lot about ecosystem services and how species are important because they're good for the economy or they're good for some kind of utility for people. And we talk about snakes also like that. But do you think that we need to be done with this now, with the whole concept of ecosystem services and utility, and just kind of go back and just say that species need to exist because of some altruistic value or because they deserve to exist. Because I think a lot of snakes and other species get left out yeah. of the flagship utility oh, yeah. debate. What do you think? No, I agree entirely. I, it, to, to try to put a purpose on every little creature's existence is ridiculous. I, I, I live on a farm. I live out in the wild. So every day I see new creatures which I hadn't seen before. And I know that they have their own lives and their own stuff going on, which is fantastic, it's, it's wonderful. And we, uh, you know, quickly spray some chemical to get rid of one species, but we end up probably wiping out a whole bunch more. We're a pretty sad lot, actually, we human beings, to be honest with you, yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Hello, my, my name is Gajender Bains. I've been a fan right from the time I saw an article about you in Span many years ago. Okay. And the Crocodile Bank has been my pilgrimage every time I go to Chennai. So my question starts from uh, where Seema started uh, this thing about the biblical reference that uh, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So how much of God's plan have you interfered with so far? <laughs> how much of? God's plan have you interfered with so far? God's plan? <laughs> that he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That the, the enmity between God, the snake and man. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's an awkward question. I'm not sure how to <laughs> attend to that. I, I, I don't actually, to be honest with you, when, when, I, when I'm f addressed or faced with a question like that, I realize that I've never put much thought into whatever I do anyway. I, I sort of work out of a feel and an instinct, you know? There's very little intellectualization there. I, mean, I just don't have the brain for it or something. But I, I, do, I just do what I feel is right, you know? It's an instinct, I think. That's all. I, I hope that, I hope that. Hi, I'm Arya and I'm 13. Um, yesterday was the last day of our school and a lizard entered our class. So um, the class of 28 was in an entire chaos and everybody was running around. A few people stood on their chairs, some on their desks. Um, the desks were here and there, some fell down. Um, in the end, some boys tried to smash the lizard. So, you know, kicking it and trying to hold their metal bottles against it. Showing off, basically. In the end, well, I had to actually pick it up with the help of, the help of one of my friends. And we went out and we put it um, near some grass. And yeah. it was limping, so we didn't know what to do. So we just left it there. I don't know what we have, what we have to do to make people aware that, you know, they have the right to live too. We don't have to sm smash them with yeah. our metal bottles. Yeah, especially since there's no dangerous lizard. I mean, w what's the big deal, you know? But I, I, I know a lot of people who are scared of house geckos, or not necessarily scared of them, but just, of, you know, uh, abhorred by them. And, and this is the same creature that's eating all those mosquitoes and, and cockroaches that you really don't want to have around the house, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's just, again, like I talked about 
we talked about snake bite and its prevention. It's getting people educated and getting people to understand and appreciate things like that. If you watch lizards and their behavior, or watch any animal and its behavior, you start getting attracted to them. You start saying, wow, there's something going on there. They've got little brains themselves, whole little lives that they're leading. It's wonderful. Children, after I picked it up, they stopped talking to me. Like, legit, I'm not speaking <laughs> to you anymore. Good. You know, you're disgusting. You picked up a lizard and you ate it when you went outside the class. But that didn't, you know, make a difference. But how can I explain to them that it's not poisonous? That, you know, just because I touched it, my hand won't turn into a sudden shade of green. No, not at all. Yeah, you just, you just have to persist, that's all. But I've, go, I've been through the same stuff most of my young life, when, when I was young too, so... <laughs> Thank Keep you. at it. <laughs> Don't give it up. Uh, Mr. Bittaker, thank you very much for this wonderful introduction to your work. My name is Dev Jani. I wanted to uh, take the question back to conservation. And uh, most of the time when we were talking of conservation, it's a kind of top-down kind of thing, you know, when without the active participation of people on the ground. Um, I would like, I would be very interested to know your uh, experience in this matter. Yeah, well, I think uh, just, the, I mean, to me anyway, the wild and the animals are just so exciting and so interesting that it's an endless source of enjoyment and pleasure. Uh, human beings are also very interesting uh, <coughs> <laughs> is survival of the fittest relevant on or, or, or has some uh, relationship with the conservation? How do we, you know? Not sure if I got that. How, I mean, is survival of the fittest relevant? For, for, for conservation? Yeah. Is what relevant? Survival yeah, it's certainly relevant. Um, unfortunately, it's not only the fittest, it's uh, the, uh, <laughs> the biggest egos. Or, <laughs> I mean, when, when we're looking at, uh, at what humans are doing to the planet, uh, it, it's, it's a very, very different thing. Uh, as far as animals are concerned, they have their own hierarchies and... Uh, it's, it's all a very natural system. We're, and we enter something very unnatural into the whole thing, to the whole equation. So it's, it's hard to answer something like that. Hi, I'm Parul, and I'm teaching zoology at University of Delhi. Mm. And uh, back when we were studying, I studied at University of Delhi only. Ecology was taken only as a theoretical subject. Okay, right now also, when we have this subject, we try to turn the questions. For example, we have one study wherein students have to find out the uh, diversity of species. There is an index that you have to find out. So what the teachers do, instead of taking them out in the wild, they basically uh, use simulation studies to find out the indices, right? So uh, the thing is that India being a huge landmass, you see that South India is very, very active and conservation pro. See, it's very easy there because Western Ghats are there. There are, you know, uh, wildlife uh, hotspots over there. Mm -hmm. I have even noticed that environmentalists or the conservation biologists who are stationed in North India, they move to South India to even conduct their studies. So there is a particular problem that we are facing in North India. Even if you uh, visit the zoo, the, uh, the Delhi Zoo, the um, reptile park, there is a complete section of reptiles over mm. there. Mm. Uh, I recently happened to visit that. It is lying vacant. There is nothing. There are dummies of snakes that are lying there. There are pythons. There are dummies of pythons that are lying there. Yeah. So I think that there is a need since you're a pioneer and uh, a, you know, a name in the field. So I think that you must suggest a way in which North India must revive the whole concept of conservation and an infrastructure must be made for that. I think you're in a wonderful position yourself to uh, promote that as well, <laughs> because through the universities and, yeah? Um, uh, 
one of the problems that I faced, I wrote to few people that I want to learn certain things because as a student, I could not. Mm -hmm. So they never reply back, right? So because they think that, oh, she's a professor, she would learn this, that. So now I would ask you, would you let me learn with you? <laughs> this is a promise that I'm taking in front of so many people. Please <laughs> bring your class to the Crocodile Bank and we'll give you a really good time. No True. problem at all. In Thank fact, you. all of you come. <laughs> Uh, I also uh, am quite enthusiastic about dinosaurs myself. Uh, but my question is uh, more related to the fact that apart from human behavior itself, um, global warming has played a huge role in the change of habitats and species behavior and their oh, yeah. habitat. Oh, yeah. um, how have you had to adapt your ways to the changes in the environment because of global warming? Or have you had to do that at all? We haven't had to do it at the moment, but I can tell you now that there are people thinking about it very deeply because I'm not sure if you're aware that the, uh, amongst reptiles and the turtles and the crocodiles, sex is determined by the incubation temperature of the egg. And that's an amazing fact. Most people thought it was genetic uh, and, uh, as it is with mammals and birds and so on. But in the case of many reptiles, it's simply temperature. That means as global warming takes over our planet, drastic changes are going to happen. And we might run out of sea turtles, for example, or certain species of crocodiles might go extinct, unless, again, humans intervene. Okay, I must ask a question. So is, is hot a male or is cold male? I'm just interested. I knew you were going to ask you that. Just knew it, right? <laughs> you, 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 you baited us successfully on that. You, you have to reveal it. Okay. Interestingly, it's different in crocodiles and turtles. And I, God, I hope I get this right because I'm going public now. <laughs> okay, with crocodiles, the cooler temperatures produce females and the warmer temperatures produce males. That's good to know. But then you get another bar in which you get high temperature females as well. In sea turtles, it's just the opposite. So th th there are some fine, some, there's some fine tuning to go with this, but that's the general sort of, yeah, it's very fascinating. When we, when we first brought this out, uh, it was leaked to me by someone who did the research in America, and I was at a symposium in Chennai with a lot of scientists. I'm not a scientist, by the way, but I was kind of a supposed scientist, and I spouted this out without having the, the data and the paper to show for it, and everyone was just laughing at me, saying, how ridiculous, They're not, it's not determined by temperature at all. But I had the last laugh. <laughs> I want to ask a simple thing, Mohit Bahal this side. Like, uh, we have dog language, right? We have a chart of dog language. Uh, dog lovers, they know a dog language, right? Mm -hmm. We can create a reptiles language chart also so that it's easy to learn for people to how to take care of them rather than to beat them or smash them. Uh, yeah, I mean, you mean keeping them as pets and this kind of thing? Keeping them as pets and also they love them like a pets lovers. That's true. Uh, people like are keeping... Expression, like example, it's, like it's dogs have different expressions. They know when they are want to uh, go, love, care and food. They show their expressions. Uh, Same ways, snakes and reptiles also show their expressions. They do, but it's slightly different. Um, it's kind of like reptiles are from Mars and uh, we're stuck earthbound. So we know dogs and, I mean, in other words, mammals and birds are very close to us in, in, in many respects and, and we can sort of visualize or, or anticipate what their needs are and, and provide their needs, whereas reptiles can't communicate their needs so well. They can, you know, like, I'm hungry or something like that. You've got to be able to suss that out. That makes it more interesting to keep them. It's not so common keep people keeping pet, uh, reptiles as pets in India, but uh, abroad in, in Europe, in the United States, it's very common. Australia as well. Fantastic. Friend told me, uh, some friend she's having, having two snakes in her home, and she kept, and she loved the way she walks, snake walks. Okay, they love with the skin and the love with the movement. So she's having two snakes in his house. Yeah, it happens. And people can get very close to their like, pets. Like uh, in other countries, Dubai, le leopards, tigers, 
people <laughs> kept them. That's true. Why can't we in India? <laughs> true. Hello. Yeah, I'm Sarujit. Just wanted to ask uh, how snakes are doing in India. Uh, their numbers are going up, they're doing well, they're getting the right kind of conservation they require? That's a, a really good question. Ever since the snake skin industry was stopped, it was a great fillip for snakes. It was very good. Uh, since then, uh, as I sort of, we talked about earlier, a lot of development of various kinds is very anti-snake or anti-wildlife in general. But uh, the awareness that is taking hold of India now about reptiles and about snakes in particular, to me, is a very positive trend. I think snakes are doing okay in general. There are specific snakes which are found in specific places in parts of the Western Ghats where dam projects are coming up and particular pieces of forest are being destroyed. We may actually find extinction happening of certain species that require uh, certain requirements of temperature and humidity in those forests. But snakes, by and large, doing pretty well in India, yeah. Yes, I really recently learned that you, the, the saw scale vipers from X, uh, the antivenom you are collecting from there, is not working from location Y. Can you please emphasize how this is happening? Yeah, that's what I started talking about right at the beginning. We're trying to take venom samples from around the country. The, the saw scale viper in Rajasthan is a, is a big snake, okay? The saw scale viper in South India is a tiny little snake. It's probably a different species. But the antivenom for people being bitten by the one in Rajasthan is being made from the venom of those produced by the Irla Cooperative in South India. So that's where the problem might arise. And that's why sometimes when people get antivenom, this doesn't seem to be working. So that's one of the problems we're working on. This is something way above me. I'm just collecting the venom. But there are people, there are scientists at the Indian Institute of Science, a guy named Karthik Sunagar right now, who are down there, who is studying the venoms, and he will probably know the answer in a year or two. But in a year or two, more people might get bitten too. So it's, it's something we've got to do fast. Good question. Though. Just, uh, just a little curious, uh, is it possible to do commercial snake farming, you know, some, some kind of uh, where, like, 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 I'm, like I would like, want to know, like, what are young Irula boys and girls doing? I mean, are they following their, whatever, their ancestral profession or have they moved on maybe to, say, engineering yeah, college, they medical have. college? So, can we explore some possibilities of commercial rearing, you know, and maybe even for snake skin, why not? Um, yes, if we want to start that debate, I would put crocodiles at the number one uh, on the list. But um, our ethos in India is that we do not want to use any wildlife even on a sustainable basis, even though it's used very... Well, in other parts of the world, uh, I worked on a project in Papua New Guinea for three years where millions of dollars are being made primarily for local people from crocodile skins and meat. And, uh, but to, 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 to bring up a subject like that in India is just uh, anathema. It's just not done. So I doubt very much. As far as your question about the Irlas, it's a very important question, and the uh, Irla Cooperative is going on to produce the venom, but it's only 350 families out of many thousands of families there, so it's very few people are, are involved in it. Young Irlas are now going to school. When I st first started working with them, hardly 5% of the children were in school. Now 90% of them are in school. They're all going on the job markets on the mainstream which is very tough for them, as you know. Tribal people don't have a very good chance of getting a mainstream job. So, yeah, it's a huge problem, and I don't know where it's going to go. As far as commercialization of snakes goes, in India, it's a no-no. Commercialization of any wildlife is a no-no, whether we like it or not. Yeah, hi, Sonia. 
uh, this side. Uh, actually, it's a very simple question. I have two questions. Uh, generally, we see it's uh, it said that reptiles lay eggs, but right now, from last some days, I have seen some uh, video trending that uh, uh, snakes delivering some babies, like mammals. I guess most of the people have seen this on YouTube. So, it's, is the truth? Is any species of the snake is doing such kind of reproduction? Oh yeah. All right. Um, so, uh, which is the vipers. Speech? Almost all the vipers have live babies. All right. And that's why they're called vipers, actually. Be that uh, uh, cobras lay eggs, water snakes lay See, eggs. Yes. Russell's vipers, sawskill vipers, uh, all have live babies. Okay. So, and vine snakes. It's interesting. You know the long snouted vine yes. snake. I was walking around uh, uh, on, in the forest once, and a, a baby vine snake landed on my head, and I just froze, I looked at it, and then a couple of minutes later, donk, one landed on my shoulder. A second baby vine snake, and I looked up and there was a female vine snake, not doing the right thing, obviously, just dropping her babies <laughs> on the fox oh. floor. I just happened to be wandering underneath at that time. It's crazy. Come on, can't you come down and do it softly and <laughs> dropping her babies like that? God, what a mother. <laughs> All right, uh, there's one more question. Uh, again, we have seen somewhere in Bangalore there was five-headed snake and something on the video. So this is a genetical disorder or it's again a species? Come on, you know what Photoshop is, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> they can That's do it. anything. Hey, yes. Two-headed snakes are not too unusual. That's, That's very possible. Yeah. Uh, so again, it's a species or it's something kind of genetic? No, it's disorder? just a freak. freak. I mean, and there are right. two-headed many kinds of animals. And oh. It just happens now and then. Not three heads. Though. All right, thank you. <laughs> we can carry forward uh, after this. Thank you very much, Romulus Whitaker, for sparing time sure. and patiently taking us all urbanites, most of us at least, through your whole world and uh, yeah. revealing it all. Thank you can so I much. Can I make one last little... Go, go ahead. Right it's ahead. my ad time. Yeah, okay, right. Snakes <laughs> of India, the hard copy. We're just running out of copies, so write to me at kingcobra at gmail.com. Right? Did you get it? Kingcobra at gmail.com. And you, Why are we not surprised? And we'll send you yes. a signed autograph copy. Of course, you have to pay for it. Though. Yeah, somebody wants to say something. Yeah. I promise to voluntarily come to the Snake Park next time I'm in Madras. Please do. <laughs> I invite our chief editor, Mr. Raj Kamalja, to give you a small thank you gift. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, it's very much my pleasure. Thanks so much.